Hello there, Discovery Learners. It is I, Teacher Liz here, your host once more for another episode of Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program. Today is the last day of November, the 30th, 2020. And boy, it's getting a little cold outside now, isn't it? I hope everyone had a delightful Thanksgiving. And hopefully you didn't eat too much food to make your stomach hurt. <laughs> we all had a nice break, but don't forget to tune in every day to the live Zoom sessions provided to you by the Discovery Educational Team. I got a pretty good episode for you guys today. We're going over all the Spanish words we learned throughout the month and putting them together to form sentences. Discovering new places, celebrating new observances, and I also have a brand new list of movies you should check out this week. So let's hop to it and start the show. And now for our daily observances. Our first observance is Cyber Monday. Cyber Monday is the internet's answer to Black Friday deals. The official observance takes place on the Monday after Thanksgiving. While internet-based companies traditionally offer their best holiday shopping on Cyber Monday to compete with Black Friday deals in brick and mortar stores, things have been changing. However, in more recent years, Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals tend to run together. Some start as early as a week of Thanksgiving and running through the holiday season, but don't neglect online deals. There may still be savings to be had. I like Cyber Monday because I don't like waiting in long lines and shopping in busy stores on Black Friday. When it comes to holiday shopping, we all want to get the best deals on the best gifts. While we're on the internet, it's also important to be safe while we're being savvy shoppers as well. So how do you observe Cyber Monday? Make your list and stick to it. This will also help you to stay on budget. Shop on trusted websites and be weary of spam, scams, and spoof sites. Shop on websites from local companies. Many small businesses also participate in Cyber Monday. You may find a deal you didn't expect, and you can also set up store pickup instead of delivery. And when all the shopping is done, be sure to monitor your credit cards, debit cards, or bank accounts for any suspicious activities. If you notice anything you don't recognize, report it immediately. So how do you plan on observing Cyber Monday Discovery Learners? Let me know in the comment section below. Our next observance is National Personal Space Day. National Personal Space Day on November 30th promotes kindness towards sensitivities and supports healing and self-protection by recognizing everyone's right to decide when and how to be touched. Touch can hurt. Many bacteria and viruses can harm. The day provides an opportunity to be aware of one person's unspoken need for space or a gentler and welcome touch. When you see someone wearing a peach symbol, forego the handshake or hug and offer a smile in any other way to show you care. National Personal Space Day encourages the use of effective symbols to essentially say, I need a little extra space today without awkwardness or hurt feelings. The peach symbol kindly raises the voice of the wearer. The mission is working to change the way people show they care. After all, we are all challenged in the 21st century at every reflective time regarding our personal space. It is also a time to allow us more understanding regarding our boundaries of others. Everyone has a story to tell of a time in their lives when they suffered from well-intentioned but unwelcome touch or closeness. Whether they are healing or challenged within a crowded work environment, are grieving, receiving chemotherapy, or simply needing more space to help protect them from harmful bacteria, viruses, and other sensitivities, such as a pat on the back, an unsolicited hug, or even a kiss. Observing one's personal space is a form of respect. So how do you observe National Personal Space Day? Well, set your boundaries and don't let others intrude on your personal space. Are you or someone you love immunocompromised? Let people know. Or do you suffer from a chronic pain condition, anxiety, or other condition that makes touch painful? Let people know. Or if you're unable to vocalize the way you feel, wearing the peach symbol is a way to signal your need for personal space. I know there may be times where we're feeling upset or sad and kind of want to be alone or not close to people at the moment. 
I think wearing a peach symbol is a good idea to signal to people that you need space. How do you plan on observing National Personal Space Day? I'm very interested to hear. Let me know in the comment section below. Another observance for today is National Mason Jar Day. Yeah, on November 30th, National Mason Jar Day commemorates the ingenious invention that's been bringing families together for generations. Simply opening a jar of fruit preserves or spicy salsa, we enjoy the flavors of summer in the midst of winter. For those who love to pickle, the mason jar rescues fruits and veggies from the garden. From green beans to watermelon, we make them sweet or spicy. While food preservation has existed for centuries, John Landis Mason from New Jersey made home canning safe. The young tin smith's patent for improvement on shipwreck bottles issued a revolutionary design. Since then, gardeners have been canning. They stocked their pantries with their victory gardens. Some padded their wallets with their heirloom connections, and many more share their bounty as colorful gifts. Mason Jar pulled double duty as a beautiful DIY project in shabby chic vases or as artfully painted desk caddy. However you use these versatile vessels, this holiday delight their existence and their utility. So how do you observe National Mason Jar Day? While mason jars started as a way to preserve the bounty of our gardens, these jars are versatile. They come in a variety of styles, both old and new. I personally use mason jars as cups here at home. I get a jar of pickles, and once the pickles are done, I wash out the jar and I use it as a big cup after that. So in essence, I'm celebrating National Mason Jar Day every day. How do you plan on observing today? Let me know in the comment section below. On this day in history. Today, in 1936, London's Crystal Palace, built in 1851, was destroyed by a fire. The Crystal Palace was a cast iron and plate glass structure originally built in Hyde Park, London to house the Great Exhibition of 1851. The exhibition took place from May 1st to October 15, 1851 and had more than 14,000 exhibitors from around the world. Gathered within its 990,000 square foot exhibition space to display examples of technology developed in the Industrial Revolution. It was designed by Joseph Paxton and the Great Exhibition Building was three times the size as St. Paul's Cathedral. After the exhibition, the palace was relocated to an area in South London known as Painage Common. It was rebuilt at the top of Penage Peak next to Sindam Hill, an affluent suburb of the large villas. It stood there from June 1854 until its destruction by fire in November 1936. On November 30th, 1936 came the final catastrophe, a fire. Within hours, the palace was destroyed. The glow was visible across eight countries. That night, a man by the name of Buckton was walking his dog near the palace with his daughter when they noticed a red glow within. Inside, he found two of his employees fighting a small office fire that had started after an explosion in the woman's cloakroom. Realizing that it was a serious fire, they called the Pendant's Fire Brigade. Even though 89 fire engines and over 400 firemen arrived, they were unable to extinguish it. The fire spread quickly and the high winds that night in part because the dry old timber flooring and the huge quantity of flammable materials inside the building helped grow the flames. All that was left after the fire were two water towers. Today, in 2004, longtime Jeopardy! champion Ken Jennings of Salt Lake City, Utah finally loses, leaving him with $2,520,700 US dollars which was television's all-time biggest game show haul. Ken Jennings, born May 23, 1974, is an American game show contestant, consultant, author, and current interim host of Jeopardy! He is the highest earning American game show contestant of all time. Jenny holds the record for the longest winning streak on the US game show Jeopardy! with 74 consecutive wins. He also holds the record for the highest average correct responses per game in Jeopardy. No other game show contestant has ever exceeded 30. 
In 2004, Jennings won 74 consecutive Jeopardy games before he was defeated by challenger Nancy Zerg on his 75th appearance. His total earnings on Jeopardy were over $4 million, consisted of $2.5 million over his 74 wins. After his success on Jeopardy, Jennings wrote about his experience and explored American trivia history and culture in his book. In September 2020, he signed on as a consulting producer of Jeopardy, a job that will include an on-air role reading categories. Following the death of longtime Jeopardy's host, Alex Trebek, Jeopardy's producer said on November 23rd that Jennings will host the show as the first of series of guest hosts. His first episode is scheduled to air on January 11, 2021. Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure is Mark Twain. Born November 30th, 1835 in Florida, Missouri. This renowned 19th century American author who wrote Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn and became famous for his unparalleled wit and storytelling ability was born Samuel Longhorn Clemens. He wrote under the pen name of Mark Twain and is widely considered one of the most important American literary figures. Before fame, he worked as a printer's apprentice and wrote for a newspaper before earning his riverboat pilot license in 1859. Six years later, his short story, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, brought him international acclaim. He unfortunately passed away on April 21st, 1910, at the age of 74. He has also been heralded as the father of American literature. Wow, happy birthday, Mark Twain. Our next notable figure is Dick Clark. Born November 30th, 1929 in Mount Vernon, New York. This American television and radio spokesman who won a Daytime Emmy and Lifetime Achievement Award in 1994 for hosting American Bandstand. Before his fame, he began his career in the mailroom of WRUN in Rome, New York. He passed away April 18th of 2012 at the age of 82. But you all may remember him from hosting Dick Clark's New Year's Rockin' Eve, which he hosted from 1973 to 2012. He would have been 91 years old today. Happy birthday, Dick Clark. Another notable figure for today is Ben Stiller. Born November 30th, 1965 in New York City, New York. This American actor, comedian, director, producer, and voice actor also won an Emmy for The Ben Stiller Show. He is most well known for films that include Heavyweights, Zoolander, Meet the Parents, and Night at the Museum series. He also voices the character Alex in the Madagascar films. He turns 55 years old today. Wow, happy birthday, Ben. And our last notable figure for today is... Chrissy Teigen, born November 30th, 1985 in Delta, Utah. This American model who debuted in the 2010 Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue. In 2014, she was featured on the cover of the Swimsuit Issue. Before she was famous, she began her modeling career on Deal or No Deal. And in 2013, she famously married the musician John Legend. In 2015, she hosted the Billboard Music Awards and has appeared as a commentator on the show Lip Sync Battle. She turns 35 years old today. Happy birthday, Chrissy. Come along as we take a journey to the place of the week. This week we are traveling to South Korea. Do you hear that song in the background? That's the South Korean National Anthem. Oh wow, it sounds nice. There's actually singing in this one. Let's go ahead and take a moment and look over the South Korean flag. The national flag consists of a white field bearing a central red blue disc and four groups of black bars. The emblem in the center is a tegu, which represents the origin and duality of the universe. Examples of this are old and new, light and dark, male and female, good and evil, are reflected in the two intertwined comma shapes. 
This symbol is also derived from the yin-yang ancient philosophy. Surrounding the tegu are four sets of black bars, each composed of three strokes in varying combination of broken and unbroken bars. These recall the sun, moon, earth, and heaven, the four cardinal directions, the four seasons, and other concepts derived of the Confucian principles. The current iteration of South Korea's flag has been in use since October 1997. Wow, they have a pretty interesting flag. South Korea is a country in East Asia. It occupies the southern portion of the Korean Peninsula. The country is bordered by the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or North Korea, to the north, the East Sea, or Sea of Japan, to the east, the East China Sea, to the south, and the Yellow Sea, to the west. The official name for South Korea is Dianmingu, or Republic of Korea. South Korea's form of government is a unitary, multi-party republic with one legislative house, the National Assembly. It also has a president and a prime minister. South Korea's capital is Seoul, and its official language is Korean. South Korea's most popular religion is Christianity, closely followed by Buddhism. But most of its citizens have no religious affiliation whatsoever. South Korea's main monetary unit is the South Korean won. 1,107 South Korean wons equals 1 US dollar. The current population for South Korea is 51,966,000 people. South Korea has a total area of 37,491 square miles. That's about the same size as the U.S. state of Indiana. South Korea's main exports are electronic consumer goods, machinery, and motor vehicles. And its major money-making industries are cell phone and automobile manufacturing, followed by tourism. Wow, South Korea seems like a very interesting place to visit. And if you didn't know, this is where the cell phone company Samsung and the car company Kia comes from. Also, ever heard of the music genre K-pop? It comes from here as well. Very cool. Can't wait to teach you more. So stay tuned all week to learn more about South Korea. Here is the animal of the day. Today's animal is the Asian giant hornet. These hornets are considered the world's largest hornet. Their bodies are 1.8 inches long and they have about a 3 inch wingspan. These hornets can be commonly found in eastern and southeastern parts of Asia, north parts of the tropics, but it's most commonly found in Japan and South Korea, where it has been well studied. You might come across it if you're a beekeeper in Asia. You run into these hornets quite regularly because they love to hunt and kill honeybees. However, in early 2020, these hornets have made their way to the United States. So far, they've only been spotted in Washington State. So how do you identify these hornets? Aside from being monstrously huge, these insects have a golden orange yellow with black and brown stripes on its abdomen. And their name? isn't a suggestion or a lie. Asian giant hornets are huge and has a stinger that's almost a quarter inch long. That and along with a highly toxic venom, which gives them a serious stinging power. In fact, when people get stung by several giant hornets at once, there's a good chance that they'll die. Approximately 50 people a year get killed by them in Japan, which is why they also have earned the name murder hornets. Most humans, however, don't really need to worry about giant Asian hornets. These insects don't have much interest in people and their hives are usually located in forests. Like most social species of wasps, they're typically only attacked when they feel their colony is threatened. So as long as people aren't showing them aggression, there's little risk. Beekeepers are the most likely people to face these deadly predators on a regular basis. But that's due to the major threat murder hornets pose to their hives. It's all because giant Asian hornets are vivacious insect predators and beehives offer an especially inviting target since there are so many larval insects available in one place. 
In fact, a small group of giant hornets can slaughter a honeybee colony containing tens of thousands of insects in just a few hours. Their goal? These bloodthirsty killers want the colony's larvae. All those adult honeybees? They're just simply in the way. And the Asian giant hornets won't stop the massacre until they get all the larvae they want. Wow, kind of scary. This species of hornet creates subterranean nests. That means underground usually by digging or occupying cavities that were dug previously by small rodents, sometimes finding suitable spaces near rotted pine roots. One hive can get as big as two feet long, and each hive consists of a queen and hundreds of workers. Yikes, these hornets are huge, and they do seem a little scary. But despite that, it's good information to know since they made their way to the United States. However, there isn't much of a risk since they're not very interested in us, unless we provoke them. So if you see a giant hornet, leave them alone. <laughs> so what do you think of the Asian giant hornets, Discovery Learners? Let me know in the comment section below. The plant of the day. Today's plant is the water chestnut. The water chestnut, or the Chinese water chestnut, is scientifically known as an edible tuber that belongs to the sage family. It's native to Asia, China, Japan, India, Philippines, etc., Australia, tropical Africa, and various islands of the Pacific and Indian Oceans. It is grown in many countries for its edible combs. Chinese water chestnut may be mistaken for the European type. Another variety of Chinese water chestnut, which have dense floating leaves and produce a horn-shaped nut. These types of chestnuts are not economically important and can become weeds. Water chestnuts aren't nuts at all, but aquatic vegetables that grow in marshes, underwater, in the mud, and has a delicate taste and a crunchy texture that makes it ideal in stir-fried sautéed vegetable dishes or simply in raw salad. Water chestnuts are leafless, tuberous, rush-like, and marginal aquatic perennial vegetables found in growing mud in margins of shallow lakes, ponds, paddy fields, swamps, and marshes. They prefer to grow in sunny locations and normally grows in rich, favorable soil that's well fertilized in shallow water. Chestnuts are grown in water that is often rotated with the rice crop. These plants grow from 50 to 200 centimeters tall, and its stem is erect, hollow and smooth, grayish to glossy dark green colored. They produce many flowers which are very small and occur on the tips of the culms. Flowers are generally produced before the plant reaches its height of vegetative growth. The plants are elongated stalins with tuber attached at the bottom. Due to the absence of leaves, photosynthesis in the plants is carried out by the culms or stems. The actual chestnut vegetable has a crispy white flesh that can be consumed raw, somewhat boiled, fried, grilled, pickled, or canned. Canned and peeled water chestnuts, whole or sliced, are normally sold in all Asian food stores around the world. It is also a very common ingredient in many of the Asian cuisines and delicacies. You could find it in your local Chinese food restaurant too. It's usually sliced and it has a texture and consistency of an apple. What do you think of the water chestnut discovery learners? Have you ever tried one before? Let me know in the comment section below. And now for the word of the day. Today's word is vermilion. It's an adjective. It means of a vivid red to reddish orange color. Vermilion. The next word of the day is voracious. It's an adjective. It means wanting or devouring great quantities of food. Voracious. Hola, Discovery Learners. So yo, who maestra Liz. Hello, Discovery Learners. It is I, your teacher Liz. And este es tu español, la palabra de la semana. What that means is, here's your Spanish word of the week. All right, Discovery Learners. The whole month went by, and so far we have learned several Spanish words. Could you tell that this month's words were within the Thanksgiving theme? They can be used around the dinner table or anytime. Here's a quick review. Por favor means please. Gracias 
means thank you. Comida means food. And familia means family. Let's use these words in a sentence. Estoy agradecido por mi familia, which means I am thankful for my family. Estoy agradecido por mi familia. Go ahead, try it with me. Estoy agradecido por mi familia. I am thankful for my family. Here's another phrase in Spanish you could practice. Me pases la comida, por favor. Pass the food, please. Me pases la comida, por favor. Me pases la comida, por favor. Say it along with me and practice the phrase. Me pases la comida, por favor. Which means, pass the food, please. Learning a new language takes time. And you may sound funny at first, but don't give up. Go ahead and practice these phrases and after a while, you'll soon notice you're able to understand some words you hear on TV or out in the community. Hasta la semana que viene, Discovery Learners! Be sure to tune in next Monday to learn another Spanish word of the week, right here on Ability to Learn. Hi there, Discovery Learners! This is Andrew Lancaster with a brand new list of movies to watch this week. It's the final day of November, so here's some final fall favorites. Let's start out by helping Pikachu solve a mystery in Detective Pikachu. This 2019 PG family film has a 1 hour and 45 minute runtime, and I suggest you choose Pikachu on Hulu. Check out this underrated stop motion comedy, Box Trolls. Rated PG from 2014, has a 1 hour and 40 minute runtime, and is available on YouTube. Here's a movie the whole family can enjoy, Paddington Bear. This PG film, also from 2014, is a family adventure and has a 1 hour and 35 minute runtime, and you can find it on Hulu. Let's take a deeper look at this cinematic work of art. Today's cinematic work of art is The Secret of Nim, based off the book by Robert O'Brien and directed by Dom Bluth starring Elizabeth Hartman as Miss Brisby and Dom DeLuise as Jeremy. The Secret of Nim is a marvel of cinema. The stunning artwork coupled with ahead of its time animation and the voice work helps the story in a way that makes you feel like they lifted it right out of your own imagination. It's at times scary, but so is the book. They're able to tell the story of these lab rats who have already overcome adversity once, now have to band together to get through a new danger. Working through their own fear and traumas, even as a child, I was able to connect to these characters, as more often than not, the spirit of a book is lost in translation when put on film. This is such an amazing feat, and that's what makes this a cinematic work of art. This classic animated film from 1982 has a rating of G and a 1 hour and 22 minute runtime. It can be found on YouTube. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know... There are some people with the fear of snow. It's true. The scientific name for the fear of snow is chinonphobia. People with chinonphobia have an irrational fear of snow, usually associated with the fear of being buried deep in snow and suffocating or being stranded in snow somewhere far away to be rescued. The term is derived from the Greek words chion and phobos meaning snow, and fear. As in most phobias, chionphobia is driven by the anxiety and categorized as a natural environment phobia. So yeah, there exist people with the fear of snow. Pretty interesting, huh? Aw, we all know what that song means means we reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun, and I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. Be sure to hit like, subscribe, comment, and ring the bell icon so you don't miss out on any of the fun here at Ability to Learn. Be sure to tune in all week for every episode of Ability to Learn. Don't forget to attend the live Zoom sessions provided to you every day by the Discovery Day program's educational team. 
this is Teacher Liz signing out. Farewell, Discovery Learners. I will see you next time.